One of the very first articles or documents that the underwriter is going to review is the actual deed itself. The deed is the mechanism of conveyance of the real property from the seller to the buyer. It's an irrevocable grant uh, or transfer. In the real estate world, we call it a conveyance of the real property. So it has to make sure that it contains all of the legal and requirements. Many states have different styles, formats, but in basic, they all have to include um, certain items for that deed to be valid. For instance, the grantor, the one selling the property or the one granting the property has to be a competent at the time of execution. We had a deal, I don't know, February of 2021, where the seller came in to the closing inebriated. <laughs> yeah, he was drunk as a skunk, dude. <laughs> he was already celebrating the sale of the property. The title officer wouldn't close the deal. She said, sorry. You know, I don't think you're in right mind right now. Um, so we had to reschedule it. And thank goodness they had a slot about two days later. And we got that in. So they have to make sure the grantors of right mind. Um, got to make sure the grantors of legal age. It's not on the overhead you can see on the screen. But still has to make sure they're of legal age. Uh, the grantee has to be adequ adequately identified. The rule says that they have to be identified in such a manner that they can be separated from the rest of the population. So in other words, you can't grant property to your best bud. You can't grant property to my favorite cousin. You have to grant property to Robert James Smith III so that they know exactly who you're talking about. The deed has to have the proper granting language or conveyance verbiage, and that kind of depends on what deed they're actually conveying. Are they conveying a warranty deed, a special warranty deed, a quit claim? So that verbiage has to match with the type of deed they're actually conveying. It has to descri describe the property. That's why the legal address is so important. You do not want to be selling 12 Smith Street and the deed have the legal address for 14 Smith Street right beside it, all right? Now, most of the time in the real estate world, we use street address because we're not very smart. We put 12 Smith Street, they, they being the title company or the underwriter will convert that to the uh, rectangular survey, you know, section three, block 47, things like that to make sure that we are actually getting the right property. It has to be properly executed, which means signed by the grantor and anybody else. I guess you could say grantor could be grantors, would maybe a better way to say that. Because if there are properties where, or states where the properties are uh, uh, tenants by the entirety, like Indiana is, where the wife has to sign away her claim, i.e. sell the property as well, she has to surrender her right to the property in the sale, you may need both the husband and the wife, all right? If it's a an estate, you may need the executor to sign. Um, if it's a trust, you may need the trustees to sign. Then that has to be acknowledged by someone and the acknowledgement, better way of saying it, is a notary that signs testifying that the grantor that is signing the property is, and there's two parts to it, all right? For those of you at home, I'm holding up two fingers. There's two parts to that. The first part of the acknowledgement is that the person who is signing is in fact the name on the deed, the grantor. So we know that it's Bill Johnson and Mary Johnson because the notary took their IDs, the very first thing 
if you've ever been to a closing very first thing that happens is the closing officer or the closer we call them takes the ID from all the parties involved to verify they are in fact who they say they are. So that's the first thing the acknowledgement does is verify that the person signing as the grantor is the one named in the deed and it is in fact them. The second thing the notary is doing is signing that that grantor is doing it of his own volition. He is not being coerced, he is not being threatened, he is voluntarily signing the document. That's why if you've ever had anything notarized, they want you to do it in front of the notary. If you've ever signed something and taken it into your bank and go, hey, can I get this notarized? Most banks are gonna go, well, not really, because we didn't witness the second part of that. Yes, I can see that that signature is yours by the ID, but I didn't, can't confirm the second part that it was done on their own volition. So that is what the acknowledgement has to have on there. So the deed is, is probably one of the main documents of conveyance that the underwriter is going to look at. Every state has its own formalities on how, like I was saying a minute ago, the form of these look like. Um, but there definitely has to be a certain context of mechanism. There has to be the proper execution, it has to be witnessed, it has to be acknowledged, it has to be delivered, and it has to be accepted. All right? The thing that is also important for you guys to remember, I'm sure you know this, that that deed does get recorded to show there was an actual transfer. Now, understand that recording of that deed does not have anything to do with A, legal ownership. If someone receives a deed to a property and doesn't record it, that doesn't mean they don't own it. The, the conveyance of the deed transfers the ownership. Now, are they gonna have a hard time uh, maybe proving it? Sure, but that's not the legality. There are many people I talk to who go, oh, well, ownership happens when it gets recorded. No, no, it doesn't. The ownership transfers the second the seller hands the deed to the buyer, it's delivered, and the buyer reach ups and receives the deed from the seller, and then it has been delivered, all right? So the grantor delivers it, the grantee receives it, boop, the deed has been, or the property has been transferred. Technically, that deed is now worthless, all right? Because it served its purpose. It has moved that ownership from or convey, let's use that word, convey that ownership from the grantor to the grantee. Now, we record that to show there was a transfer. That way the seller later down the road go, I didn't sell that property. Well, yeah, we recorded the deed, all right? So a lot of county, and there are other people that want the deed recorded too, by the way. I mean, the, cur the current grantor wants off the tax records, right? So they don't want to pay real estate tax on that property if they don't own it. The lender wants it recorded because they're going to probably place a lien on that property. The current grantee, the buyer, he would like to have it recorded because that's proof that he has an asset and there could be equity in that asset that he may need to tap into later, like a home equity loan or something else like that. So there are a lot of reasons to record it. A lot of parties want it recorded, but understand that recording actually has nothing to do with the ownership. And for those of you that don't really believe that, let me ask you a question. What year did the recorder's office come into being? Make up a year. I don't care. David, what do you got? Make up a year. 1920? Cool. We'll go with 1920. Are you telling me then no land was ever sold before 1920? <laughs> exactly my point, all right? So recording technically has nothing to do with the ownership of the property. It just shows there was a transfer at that date, all right? So let's refill our coffee. We're gonna take a small break for you, those of you live. Uh, for you at home, get, refill your coffee and we'll be right back. <laughs> 